Good evening. Good evening. Hello, everybody. Hello. How's everyone? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for being here. We're really excited to, um, you know, this week kicked off the Appalachian theme term with our College for Seniors, and this is the first of um, a series of events that we're hosting about Appalachia. Um, we're really pleased to have David Weinschaub here. I've spoken on the phone with David for a few years now, but this is the first time we've actually had an opportunity to meet, so it's nice. Um, so we are grateful that you're all here. Um, David Weinschaub, uh, you'll see outside, out front all the films and you can take a look at the information about his work than he does, but just to give you a little intro, um, he's an award-winning film director, having produced nearly three dozen films that have screened at film festivals around the world and on public television. He's the founder and director of the Center for Cultural Preservation that seeks to preserve South, Appalach South Appalachian culture through a multi-county elder wisdom project that has completed more than 200 videotaped oral histories with mountain elders throughout the region. I stumbled over South Appalachia because I, I've always just thought of it as Appalachia, but then my grandmother recently was excited to tell me they started a Northern Appalachia Folk Festival in her town. I never knew that we were Appalachian until then. Uh, Weinschaub believes that understanding how people lived their lives before Walmarts and plastic devices ruled our lives is important to re excuse me is ruled our lives is important to rekindle how southern communities can find ways to live more resilient more authentic lives. Weintraub has also published more than a dozen books is a columnist uh, with his local newspaper and dabbles in law when he can find the time. And uh, how do you find the time? That's the secret everyone wants to know. Um, as self-proclaimed environmental troublemaker for the area, Weintraub has worked with a half a dozen environmental organizations, including a, as director of the Environmental and Conservation Organization, in order to create a better balance between development and protecting our natural inheritance. Finally, he's the owner of Weintraub Films, a boutique film production company that produces documentary films for businesses and families that, uh, from which to tell their story. Um, so mentioning plastic devices, please make sure you turn your cell phones off. And I'm going to welcome David Weintraub up. Thank you. Good evening. How are you? Good. So I, I was just mentioning in the hallway, um, this is the, I've been making films for about 20 years now. This, my first film, it took like seven years to come out, um, I showed here. Um, a number of years ago, it was uh, about Jewish culture in South Florida. And we had a klezmer band. I don't know if anyone here was there. Um, but we had a klezmer band, and we showed the film, and we had this rollicking discussion. And there were so many people who knew that history um, who were at that film showing. So it was kind of, it was really fun. And it was such a great showing that I actually filmed the discussion, and it became one of the DVD extras. So. Um, um, this is just a fascinating place. You attract so many interesting people. So uh, thank you, interesting people, for coming. <laughs> so this, um, I've, you know, as most people, I've always had a close relationship with rivers, um, except my first experience wasn't the best. Um, I grew up in a big city downwind from a landfill. Um, my closest river um, wasn't very far from our apartment building, but you could smell it a lot before you got to it. Um, and so it was called Spring Creek, which sounds so idyllic, you know, it's beautiful, um, a little traveling brook. Um, but it was filled with construction debris, um, s dredging materials, and the tributaries were covered by a sanitation incinerator, a post office parking lot, um, and a wastewater treatment plant, and every time it rained, um, millions of gallons of raw sewage would be dumped into this river, into Jamaica Bay. And so, uh, and did I mention the bodies? Um, it was so smelly, and people wouldn't go near it, that actually the mob would dump, it was like a resting place for uh, some of the, um, uh, uh, some of these uh, people. And I guess nobody would go there to find those bodies, um, so I don't know how they ever did. But this was my first experience um, going to a river. And so uh, as I grew up, I kind of felt like this was, you know, all rivers were stinky and smelly, and, and this was what they were. But my parents became teachers, and so um, they had the summers off, and so when I was about eight years old, we got to go to the country, and, and for us, the country was the Adirondack Mountains. And I almost, I almost remember the moment 
where I felt like it was the first time I had ever breathed, you know? I, we opened up a window and the air was sweet and the mountains and you saw birds not like flying trash from the incinerators. Um, it was just an incredible experience. And so I, I felt like I died and went to heaven. I was catching frogs and snakes and salamanders like, like, like boys will do um, or kids will do. And um, it was just an amazing experience, just sitting there by the river and just hearing the, the beautiful sound. And so um, I got here as quickly as I could, and um, I wanted to raise my son having that experience and not having to have the bad experience, but just have the good experience. Of course, now he wants to move to a big city when he you know, grows up because uh, it's too sweet and too slow, and you know, he has to have the incinerators and the pollution. So. Um, but, uh, so I always wanted to know, well, what was, where did all this come from? What was the history of all this? And so um, I had the distinct pleasure of being able to interview uh, folks from the Eastern Band of Cherokee, tribal elders, um, elders in South Carolina, elders in many, many tribes. And um, it was fascinating to me to hear about the spiritual connection that people had with their rivers and streams, that, that every river, every body of water was considered sacred and needed to be protected. We're so different than the Western mentality, you know, as Spring Creek was, where we focus on dominion and control. Um, and, and although the early pioneers to this area took their lead from the Cherokee, and certainly, um, you know, our, the local spring and the local stream was, was so important and a critical part of, of their lives. But then, in the industrial era, all things, all bets were off. Uh, we had tanneries and paper mills, um, straight piping. Um, people would tell me that the French broad, I mean, you just couldn't go near the French broad. It was just so smelly and stinky. Um, and so I thought, and then you had these amazing heroes, the Wilma Dykemans here, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglases in South Florida, the, the Dead Pigeon River Council in East Tennessee, these people who had the foresight um, and the belief that we could do better and that we had some models in the past. And, um, and so we've had this kind of pendulum going back and forth and back and forth. Um, you know, Wilma Dykeman galvanized folks and then you wonder today, well, which way is the pendulum going? And um, I thought it was important to make a film, to tell this story, um, that there are many, many, many success stories, and there's also many, many, many challenges. And if we are to move forward as a people, as a community, we need to know where we came from. You know, it's like that little sign next to an elevator, you know, you are here. Um, that's what I think the power of documentary film is, is it tells you where you are and helps you guide you on where you need to go. So without further ado, Guardians of Our Troubled Waters. Sorry about the hamsters got tired running around that wheel, so it kind of sputtered out at the end. Sorry about that. It wasn't intentional. It didn't happen before. We're going to have a little panel discussion, and we have Erica Romanishin from Haywood Waterways Association, Executive Director, and we have the French Broad River um, Riverkeeper here as well. And so um, we're happy to take your questions and uh, talk about some of the river issues yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Mine's working. Can you hear me now? <clears throat> okay, cool. So we were talking in, at the, in the beginning about this pendulum going back and forth and back and forth from the native um, approach that every waterway is sacred to the industrial era where <coughs> how do we use this and ultimately how do we abuse it? Um, 
to this early call of stewardship from uh, people like Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and Wilma Dykeman and, and the folks, uh, the Dead Pigeon River Association. And so I guess what I learned in making the film is um, this pendulum isn't some like spiritual, some, you know, thing, divine thing that uh, from the sky. We are the pendulum. We get to decide which way the pendulum moves, whether it's towards stewardship or whether we just figure out how many people can we fit in every um, square foot of land, um, come hell or high water and how it affects our waterways. And so it's our job to talk, to come to commission meetings and go to city council meetings, to write letters to the editor, um, to demand that our policymakers do what needs to be done, and to take responsibility in our own backyard um, and live our lives in a way that's responsible and understands the consequences to our natural resources. So it's not enough to paddle our streams and to go on hikes and take beautiful pictures of the, you know, we live in this beautiful area. Um, but uh, protection of our natural resources is not, is not a spectator sport. Um, it's up to us to be the heroes that um, nature is asking us to be. And so um, with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions, comments, and or hysterical outbursts, um, and uh, turn it on, to turn it over if, if we have, okay. So let me start with you. So your, your question is, so what is everyone's responsibility? I guess, you know, what comes to m top of my head would be uh, the proportional impact that each of us has on, on our natural resources. Um, <clears throat> many people think, well, you know, all I'm doing is living my life, you know, I'm just going to Walmart and buying all these packages of things and, you know, I look at the numbers on the bottom of the packages and I put it in the right bins and, and so wh wh why am I responsible? Um, but, you know, I think it depends upon the level of impact we have. Champion Paper, you might say, has um, a bit more response. If, if, I, if, I, if my septic system is leaking and it's going into my local stream, I, I'm responsible for fixing that. I'm responsible for nothing getting off of my backyard that changes the nature of that stream. And so I guess my point of view would be that a corporate uh, stakeholder um, should have their proportional responsibility as well, but they don't. And that's, you know, you see the big signs about, in East Tennessee, about, you know, Lord help us, because EPA won't. I mean, EPA was as much of the problem as, um, as the company. In fact, the, the papers came out later that the EPA actually had um, hidden documentation that demonstrated that dioxin was killing uh, animals and people a long time before it actually got out into the press. So I guess, you know, top of my head, I'd say it was, would be proportional responsibility. And a, a mountaineer who um, has a small farm on a river um, and is 
mindful of the fact that that soil should stay on his farm because it's a whole lot more expensive to get it back on the farm than it is to prevent it from getting off to begin with. Um, if, if he's taking responsibility, then he's a, a good steward. Um, it, farming doesn't necessarily mean that you're a polluter. Um, just as develop, being a developer doesn't necessarily mean you're a polluter. Um, we've gotten away from the notion of, um, of being good stewards uh, of creation. And we've forgotten what that means. And we've forgotten to, to look at the consequences of, of living on this planet and the impact we have given the number of our species on this planet today and the proportional impact it has. Um, but let me turn it over to you guys who might have better, more coherent things to say. I have a thought, yeah. Um, in my experience in Haywood County, so Haywood Waterway is a nonprofit in Haywood County, we work on non point source issues. And a big part of my job is education and outreach and with people across the board, all ages, all economic uh, level, any, any category, you name it. And some of the things I've seen is that um, people either don't know that they're polluting, and so it's, I feel that like it's on us to put the education material out there any way we can. And then there are those who may know they're polluting, but don't have the means to fix it. So part of my job is also to find those technical and financial resources to help that person fix the issue. And I'd say 99% of the people who are polluting are more than happy if we can bring technical financial resources to fix it. There's always that 1% or so that just don't want to do anything, don't tell me what to do mentality. So how do you get the resources? Uh, working in partnerships, that's a huge thing. Nonprofits, you know, limited staff, limited financials. So working in partners with like the Haywood Soil and Water Conservation District, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, um, US EPA, US Fish and Wildlife Service, all those acronyms. Um, they'll either have the technical skills or know of how to get the financial resources there too. And oftentimes it's a collaboration of more than one. I think David brought up a good point about you know being advocates because we live in an incredibly rich country and but depending on who's you know carrying the purse strings those resources don't always flow the way we might think they should you know what I think all of us probably agree there should be more money put towards environmental protection so Eric can get more of those great projects in the ground and you know so it sometimes it does go back to who our elected officials are and who we're putting in charge of those purse strings I mean there's a great program that was cut in the Great Recession called the uh, North Carolina Wade Program. And they went out and they looked for straight pipes and they did a lot of the stuff Eric was talking about, replacing bale and septic systems. They cut the budget and, and they've yet to re-implement that as, as our economy has improved because it's not a priority for our current elected officials. And that was an amazing program. I mean, they fixed thousands of bale and septic systems and the impact was tremendous. But you know, nobody's clamoring for it and the folks in charge don't care. So that's where it's kind of up to us to tell people that kind of, that's where we want our money spent and it can make a big difference. I mean, I guarantee none of you have ever heard of that program. You know, that's the kind of stuff that flies under the radar, except for, you know, the people that are in charge know about it. They're just not doing it because we're not telling them to do it. So. And I think co co collaboration definitely is, 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 is the key word. Um, one of my biggest successes as an environmentalist when I was running ECO was the Mills River Partnership. There was a big fish kill on the Mills River. The Mills River, as you heard in the film, um, is the source of drinking water for most of Henderson County and all of um, South Buncombe. And um, there was a big fish kill in 2007. There was a, a pesticide, fungicide that washed into the stream. and, and um, Mills River that was considered one of the highest quality rivers in western North Carolina all of a sudden dropped down to the low man on the totem pole. And um, 
we could have just jumped up and down and pointed at the farmers and said we need better rules and you, know, you guys you know, need to pay and all of that stuff. And, but we knew that wasn't going to work here. Um, and so what we did was we got farmers together and we got environmentalists together and, and the water system people and governmental people and we all sat down in a room for months and months and months and, and at first we were going to kill each other. Um, but we survived, there wasn't too much blood on the floor, and um, after a while we realized that there were many things that we could do that didn't, wasn't um, just regulations and rules, but was voluntary, and people wanted to feel like they were being good stewards. They wanted to put in their brochure and on their sign, and when people came to buy the food, that, you know, we are a good steward for clean water. Um, nobody wants to be, I don't think there's maybe psychotics, but I think the average person wants to do the right thing um, if they have some guidance and some support to do that. And so all of a sudden, farmers started putting these grassy strips in and changing the direction of their rows so that when you know the pesticides went in and the rain, they didn't go back out to the river and then they had to put it back on again. Um, and so not earth-shaking things necessarily, but some very, some great steps forward. Um, and that partnership is continuing today and we're seeing other aspects of that in other places in the region. And so to me, the collaboration is the key. We need to speak the language of the people who live here um, and not focus on blame and uh, responsibility, but how we can work together to solve our problems. Because uh, we know Democrat or Republican, um, ten, we tend to not see those answers coming from the political parties and the political system um, unless we demand it and work together to make it happen. Um, what is polluting the river right now, other than coal ash? One of our biggest issues, well, we heard in the film there, and I think it's common, in Haywood, Buncombe counties is sediment and bacteria. Those are the two biggies right now. I said it very eloquently in the film, but <laughs> for those of you who didn't hear, uh, sediment, it seems complicated. Sediment is just dirt. Uh, a lot of it, extra dirt in the river suffocates aquatic life, clogs fish gills. Dirt comes from construction sites, from farms, and from eroding stream banks. And bacteria is a fancy name for poop. And it comes from septic system, failing septic systems, sewer pipes, and agricultural runoff. And so tackling those is, is challenging sometimes. There's some good rules for some of those. There's some really not good rules for others. There's funding for some, not as much for others. So it's a, it's a challenge. I, so I have a quick follow-up question to that, I guess. So I think of um, the kind of the downstream neighbor as also the next generation in terms of who we're thinking about how we're affecting. But I have neighbors that live upstream from me, and um, their cows are, their water source is the creek that feeds into the Ivy River. And I just don't know what the best solution is. I don't know. Do you have success talking with people about those types of, um, can you put, put a water source in for your cows that isn't the creek that feeds the river that feeds, you know, um, or are people resistant because they, it's my land. I, I, I don't know if either of you, I would assume, could. We've had success with that in Haywood County. Um, there's a lot of agriculture over there. And, um, I indirectly work with the farmers. I rely more on the Soil and Water District and the NRCS. And I do know that they, oft, they have a, an application system for financial resources to help the farmers. And they frequently have more applicants than they have available funding. So they do have a priority process as well. It takes into account uh, what the issue is and how severe it is. So they are tackling the most severe issues. And in some cases, the smaller farmers, the smaller situations just might slide by every year. How far upstream does the bacteria have to start before you can swim in it again? <laughs> Yeah, it does settle out pretty fast, <laughs> particularly, uh, I mean, kind of the rule in the French Broad is when it rains, the bacteria levels spike and the river's muddy. Right now is a great time to go swimming. It hadn't rained in like three weeks. The river's clear. Bacteria is low. Probably the same. And that's mostly like non-point source. I mean, that's like runoff from, from agriculture, but also like sewer overflows when it rains. You'll get sewer overflows and that. And it also, bacteria will live in the sediment for a period of time. So it, 
we'll resuspend that and, and send it down river. But yeah, the, the non-point store stuff that Eric's working on is, is, the, is really the hardest stuff. Like the Clean Water Act was passed and it said it was illegal to pollute without a permit. And we've made really good progress with that. Not that there's no problems with that, but by and large that has been dramatically improved from where it was in 1972 in the passage of the Clean Water Act. Now it's the hard stuff that like Eric's dealing with. It's the, the, few, the few cows, the pig farm, the construction site that washes off, the fertilizers and pesticides, like that stuff is hard to tackle. And not always great rules, particularly around agriculture. There's really not many good rules and regulations around agriculture. Right, the rules are completely different when it comes to agriculture and logging. Um, but, but many, all the counties have so on water and there's a cost share, share program. So, you know, you might want to be talking to your local so on water folks and see if they would be the, in the best position to talk to the farmer about fencing um, the, the cattle out and other things they can do that are cost effective and, um, and make them, put them back on the good stewards list and give them the gold medal. Um, all of these, the sedimentation issues, and sedimentation is the number one water quality issue in, in this country, in the world. Um, and it's not, it didn't come out of anywhere. The water has a natural flow and it's, you know, trees and plants and grass, you know, slows the water down and percolates slowly into the soil. So, you know, in a natural situation, only a small percentage of that water would actually get to the waterway. Um, but once we've changed the nature of the land, we make it flat, that we make, you know, we put pervious surfa impervious surfaces in, rooftops and driveways and, st and roadways and stuff like that, all bets are off. And so when you s watch that water, I mean, you go to Mills River on a rainy day and you feel like you're gonna be washed downstream and the farms are now lakes and um, the, the roadways have become rivers and um, it's, it's scary to be out there unless you're wearing waders and a, and a PFD. Um, so, yeah. Does anybody have, yep. We used to hear a lot about the Army Corps of Engineers uh, giving permits, withholding permits for things like lakes and ponds. And are they still involved in, or are they involved in any of the same things you all are? Yeah, so you still need a, a Army Corps engineer permit and a Division of Environmental Quality permit if you want to do anything in a water body. So if you want to build a dock, a dam, a bridge, you have to get those permits to make sure you're not going to impact that waterway. And there's a stream bank. Yeah, fix a stream bank. And the deal is you, you want to, like, I think I'm right about this, you want to, the first rule is you want to avoid the impact, and then if you can't avoid it, you have to mitigate the impact. So if you, if you've got to build a highway and it's got to get part of this wetland, you need to try to not impact the wetland, but if you have to, then you have to do something good somewhere else. And that works a little bit sometimes. <laughs> what I lo love about the Army Corps of Engineers is they used to make great documentary films about what they did. They did everything the wrong way, but they, they filmed everything and the evidence is the smoking guns were there. I could have not made this film or it wouldn't have been as good a film without all, all that stuff about what they did to the Everglades and what they were doing to uh, you know, build these dams in East Tennessee, I mean, it's horrendous. But they document it all and they, you know, they jump up and down about all this exciting stuff that they were doing and so we got the show the wrong way and then the people who were doing it the right way. So, you know, that's, uh, you know, and it's, you know, bureaucracy and government and wrong-minded thinking. It's the thinking that we can control everything and that the solution always, the solution to pollution was dilution, was, you know, that came from these guys, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers and the Tennessee Valley Authority, that all we do, if we get enough water, shoot, you know, turn all the rivers, you know, all the clean streams into ditches and shoot them into the polluted rivers and we'll clean everything up. Forget about where it's coming from, where the pollution is coming from. It's, it's crazy. Um, but I love, I love that they're filmmakers, so. <laughs> <coughs> this is a, a sort of follow-up to that uh, in the sense, I, I grew up in South Florida in Broward County, right on the edge of where all those canals are. Did you, did you know about Governor Broward? 
I didn't know uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. <laughs> no. Yeah. The first guy who said drain the swamp. Yeah. Way before the current president. Right. right. But you know, when I was a child, those those canals were touted as progress, and this is wonderful, and now we can grow all these oranges. And uh, nobody was ever talking about the the downside of it. Uh, but that you featured the Everglades and Western North Carolina, I just wondered, you know, how you made that connection and why you put them both together in this film. Well, I was going to make ju a film just about Western North Carolina, but it's not a Western North Carolina problem. Um, this this notion of dominion and control over natural resources and that um, all the solutions can be found in some bureaucrats in some office somewhere and not learning from the native people who have been doing this for tens of thousands of years. Um, I didn't want to just focus on our little enclave here. And I've lived in South Florida, and I love the Everglades, and I spent every weekend uh, paddling and you know, watching the gators uh, swim by, or you used to hear the loud plop, plop, plops. You didn't see them necessarily, except in mating season, then you saw them. Um, and I thought, you know, sometimes the best way to exemplify a point is through reflection, and the best reflection is to look at another place and say, how boneheaded could they possibly, oh, oh, wait a second, that's, we're doing the same crap here. Um, and so sometimes having those parallel tracks to me helps us better understand what the problem is, that it isn't just um, boneheaded people here or there, it's this philosophy that, um, industrialization is the answer to all of our problems, that consumerism will solve all our problems, that technology will solve all of our problems. And we still have the same philosophy today, and I think it's a failed one. And I think when I make history films, I make it because there's so much wisdom and knowledge from our elders and our indigenous people, and if we took one-tenth of that knowledge and applied it today, we'd have a completely different world. We'd have cleaner water, we'd have cleaner air, we'd have live happier lives that weren't tied to stuff. Um, so that's my t little 25 cent answer to you. <laughs> it, that's a bigger question, but yeah. But, but that's, you know, I just saw, so th I thought Florida was a, a great parallel and, and so many people come here to flee um, all the development that's going on in South Florida. and. Um, most people have no notion. I mean, when it rains hard in Miami, people are complaining to the government, why is my house flooding? Well, you know what? They're living in where the Everglades used to be. My first oral history I ever did in South Florida was this 90-year-old lady who lived on, on the edge of the Everglades on 27th Avenue. Do you know where, where people are living now? On 150th Avenue. Miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. And so they're living where the Everglades used to be. So na nature takes, you know, water will seek its lowest level. And that's, you know, they're living in the swamp. They are the Everglades. Um, they are the alligators today. <laughs> right. I think we're just about out of time. Do you have a burning? Thank you. Thank you. that, what a better world it would be. But, but I do want to thank you for that. I do want to also say that for most of the film, it was, I was rather depressed. It really was, you know, it really was just one of those things. And I've lived on the west coast of Florida for 35-ish years. And, and um, last year I was there when I had never seen such a fish kill and a stench. It was just unbelievable. And of course that's the red tide, maybe a slightly different issue. But, but I think what there was a collective feeling down there was that Boy, are we just really losing this war? I mean, wh 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 when does it get better? Does it get better? This, and, and I just want to thank all of you because without you folks kind of kind of leading the fight and doing it, it would be just still so depressing, you know. And it just seems like who's fighting the fight? And you know, we can send our little check once a year, whatever, to Sierra Club or whomever, wherever. But but it just seems like it just so often feels so hopeless. And that's a lot of what a lot of people on the west coast of Florida felt last year is the dead fish. Would be flying into the canals, you know, it just felt, what can we 
you, that feels so hopeless. But you, you, you bring an element of, I think, some inspiration. There are good people out there fighting the fight. I thank you, I thank you guys all, because guys like me, uh, whatever, folks like, uh, like me, you know, you do your little part as best as you can, but it just seems so enormous to kind of ever see the solution and how it's ever gonna change. I'm sorry to be a downer about this, but again, it's, it's important, it's, it's impactful, and I thank you for doing this, um, but it still leaves me um, saying, what do I do more, I can't go out. Sure. I, lo I love the thing you did with the kids, uh, the kids in the stream kind of thing. Mm -hmm. there's, another, there's a ray of hope as well. So the next, next generations are coming forth and, and they're looking to maybe undo what has been done. So I'm just thanking you guys. I, and then I, I completely understand your, your, your sadness and depression. I try to make my environmental films not focusing on just the problem. I used to do an environmental film festival in Henderson County and I used to kid with my volunteers to make sure there's no sharp objects in the door near the doorway on the way out because they're so depressing the little baby you know polar bear and the I melting ice flow and you want to rip your heart out but um, unless um, I don't pull punches in my films but I also focus on the fact that there are solutions and the reason why there's red tide is because they've put a dike around Lake Okeechobee and they turn that into a cesspool, right? There's no flow. This was a river. There's a whole, the, lake, the Kissimmee River and, and Lake Okeechobee had a big, big um, overflow and that would go into the Everglades and there was a whole system there that cleansed itself. And once we, we said, oh, you know, we have to worry about floods because we're gonna flood people who live nearby, we're gonna flood out farms. Once we put those dikes around that, all of a sudden, it became th this incredible algae bin, and then they built these ditches to go west and to go east. So guess where all that red tide and, and green, um, blue-green algae is coming from? It's coming from that issue. And so the, the, the newspapers, the media, the corporations who are engaged, who are doing this, um, wanna make it sound complicated. It's very simple. Take the freaking dikes down, let it flow, um, buy people out who live too close so they won't get flooded, you know, the, the basements won't get flooded out, and we create the natural systems. We have been here for so many thousands of years because we've lived in connection with nature. It's only the last hundred years or so that we've thrown all of that out the window. So I do history films because if we know where we got, how we got here, then we can work our way back out. Um, Everything we've created also allows us that creativity can be applied to solutions as well, not to obscuring the problem. One more thing on a happy note, if you, it's e environmentalists are like the most depressing <laughs> downer people of all time. And like, we're great at doing that. But the cool thing about rivers is if you quit screwing them up, they'll get clean. I mean, every river in America is cleaner than it was 30 years ago. It's not as clean as we hoped it would be, and there's a long way to go, but we've come a long way. And if you, if you find the source, I mean, you know, Eric talked about Hyatt Creek. It was, it was a total mess, and it's a lot cleaner than it used to be. Like, you can do it. It's not done forever. You just gotta fix the problems, which is not always easy, but we have come a long way. We have one more quick question, and then I think we're gonna have yeah, to. Yeah, I'm it just up. curious now that the. Corps of Engineer has seen and know that they know that the meandering river was a good thing and the canals were a bad thing. Um, if they have reached enlightenment and can be trusted to help, or are, are we still uh, suspicious of the Corps of Engineers? <laughs> Thomas Jefferson said um, uh, that democracy depends upon the vigilance of the citizenry. And so, um, it's up to us to demand that they do the right thing. Because um, they still think they know everything. And um, we need to dispose them of that notion. <laughs> just, just a quick thing here is um, I run a very small nonprofit organization, the Center for Cultural Preservation. The way we survive, um, part of the way we survive is selling DVDs, which you can talk about arcane um, medium these days, uh, but it's, it's, um, it's what we do. Um, we also depend upon community support to keep us going. So we have a table out there with our DVDs. Um, we're 
beginning work on a new film about moonshining in the mountains. Uh, I have to do a taste test before I get started, so uh, um, there's a lot of tasting I have to do. But um, somebody has to do it. And yeah, someone has to do it, and we're going to kick off with a with a fundraiser in a number of months with actual taste testing of of legal moonshine. I can't do the other stuff because um, it's hard to make a film in prison. Um, but so I appreciate you coming. Thank you so much. I appreciate er Eric Romanitians, all his great work in Haywood Waterways, all the excellent work Hartwell Carson, Mountain True, and the French Broad Riverkeeper does um, in alerting us, informing us, advocating, and uh, and thank you for being new river heroes of the South as well. Thank you all again. Thank you, David, for sharing your film and all your um, expertise on this topic. I'm sure that we'll all be following the river uh, health more closely now. Um, and for you all, please thank you for coming, and please stay tuned for our, our next program in the series for Appalachian um, themes and culture and environment and everything else. Thank you.